Um, I really appreciate you, particularly this time of year, being willing to uh, give of your time uh, to uh, listen to us talk about uh, things that we do that we think can help your practice. Uh, and we're going to have some demonstration of that. But I know this is a phenomenally busy time uh, for school psychologists. And uh, so I am very much appreciative of you being willing to share your time today. We're going to be talking about uh, the BAST reflex monitor, which I have to tell you is my very favorite thing about all things BASC. Uh, it's just absolutely unique. There's nothing quite like it. And as you know, most tests are copyrighted. Uh, I want to tell you that the flex monitor is so unique that it's been granted three United States patents because of the process that we had to create to create the flex monitor. So it truly is unique. And I hope you will see uh, as we go through this this morning, the power that the flex monitor puts in your hands. So I'm going to do a brief overview of the flex monitor and how it works and conceptually why you should use it and demonstrate our profiling capabilities, particularly for progress monitoring. And then I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Hughes and Dr. Quinn, who have actually been using this in real practice with real kids in real school. Uh, and they are going to show you an example of what they've been able to do and why they are also excited about the flex monitor and its capabilities. So uh, it is a key part of the BASC three family. And it's one that Randy and I felt like would really be essential so that you can document whether or not your interventions are working. And that's really critical because if they're not working, we absolutely need to know that so we can change them. We need to tweak what we're doing. We need to get better. So we need to see if what we're doing is working. And we can individualize that. But also remember that Randy and I are authors of the, of the Flex Monitor. And as I talk about it today, I'm going to say nice things about it uh, because it's my baby. And what you know is that everybody thinks their baby's pretty, right? Whether it is or not. And uh, so I think the Flex Monitor is pretty. So what is it? What is it? I've been giving you this great buildup, and I hope it lives up to it. it. It really is a psychometrically sound means that allows you to develop customized teacher, parent, or self-report forms tailored to your needs in a specific situation, or you can tailor it to an individual case or even a program need. And in fact, uh, one of the major uses that we're seeing with the flex monitor is that school districts have decided to evaluate specialized programs. And one of those that's getting a lot of application with the flex monitor are specialized programs for children on the autism spectrum. So several districts have gone in and they've created a specialized flex monitor that matches the goals of their intervention program for children with ASD. And that way they're able to monitor these kids as a group to see whether or not their ASD program is in fact being effective. And they can gather group data with a form, and this is the key part and why the flex monitor is so useful, with a form that is customized to their program's goals. They're able to select the things that match what they are trying to do. As you develop these customized forms, we create reliability data and standardization data in the background for each and every form that you create. And you can create as many forms as you want. The flex monitor can be used to monitor behavioral and, and emotional functioning over any desired period of time. It can be administered as frequently as you want the data. 
you'll have the ability with the flex monitor to choose an existing monitoring form. And these are forms that I'll describe momentarily, but these are forms in specific areas that Randy and I developed that we thought, hey, um, if folks want a general form for monitoring externalizing behavior, here's a really good one. You don't have to do the work. We put this one together. But the real power of the Flex Monitor is in you building your own form. So you can create a form using our item bank. And I'll describe that item bank in just a few minutes. But you can create your own test. We make you a test author. You can choose if you want to build a form and create a test for a teacher, a parent, or a student, or you can create three parallel forms. You can create a flex monitor form for the teacher, for the parent, and for the student that contain essentially the same items. So you can monitor from all three perspectives simultaneously. Or you can have very different items that reflect the different environments of school and home, but are assessing the same underlying construct. So you have that flexibility. You can administer it digitally or via paper and pencil. You can send folks a hot link to the form that you've created. And once you've created and saved your form, we allow you to then send hot links for that form. Or if you prefer, and in some situations, you do need to still use paper and pencil, particularly sometimes with parents, you can print the form yourself. And there's no, there's no added cost for printing your own paper forms. And the Flex Monitor comes with permission to do that. So that's not an issue. You can set up recurring administrations over a specified time period so that you're always queued up to follow up when follow up is due. You can generate monitoring reports to evaluate change over time. And I'm gonna show you one of these as an example. And uh, then Dr. Hughes and Quinn are going to show you what it's looked like for them over time with individual children where they've been using this system so successfully. The parent ratings and the self-report are also all available in Spanish. And I want to elaborate on that just a little bit. For those of you who don't know, um, all of the Spanish forms of the Basque were developed in a very unique way and are equated to the English forms. We do not have separate norms for the Spanish versions of the Basque because they're not necessary because we equated the English and the Spanish versions during the actual development process. When we developed Basque 3, we also did this, by the way, with Basque and Basque 2. We wrote all the items in both languages. We had the items vetted by professional translation companies, but also had the items vetted for accuracy by bilingual school psychologists from all around the country until we had equated the language and everybody agreed this choice of Spanish word works where I live. And then we normed everything. And as we normed it in English and Spanish and collected the data, when we did the item selection, we required all the items that ended up on the final version, and that includes the 700 plus items in the Flex Monitor item bank, to have equivalent item statistics in both English and in Spanish. And as you all know, but maybe you've forgotten from your test and measurements class, norms are simply a Transform a mathematical transformation of aggregated item data. So if the item data are identical, the norms are identical. 
so we have equated versions in English and Spanish. And all of that equating process applies to all the items in the flex monitor item pool. So I think that makes it a much more valuable tool in Spanish than folks realize. The predetermined forms that I mentioned that you can choose, there are four standard forms with pre-selected items that are available as teacher and parent ratings for progress monitoring. These are all available to you to pick on Q Global. Uh, they're already there. All you have to do is click on them. These are age appropriate predetermined forms. They're associated with ADHD. Uh, we have an ADHD monitoring form, an internalizing problems form, one for disruptive behaviors, one for developmental social disorders, uh, which is kind of code for uh, being on the autism spectrum, because if, if autism is not a developmental social disorder, there's not one, right? For self-report, we have two predetermined forms for internalizing problems and school problems. These forms are essentially expert derived. If you believe that Randy and I are experts in, uh, uh, in picking test items, uh, boy, we've sure had a lot of practice at it. So uh, these are forms that we built based on our knowledge of the literature our own assessment practices and work with children and families. But these are general predetermined forms tied to these areas. So keep that in mind. And you can, as I'll show you momentarily, go into the Flex Monitor database and say, hey, I don't like Randy and, and Cecil's ADHD monitoring form for Johnny here. Johnny's problems are 90% attention and 10% impulse control. So I'm going to build my own ADHD monitoring form that focuses primarily on attention issues, but there's a few impulse issues I need to include. So I'm going to pull those items in too. So you can build the ADHD monitoring form that is specific to the target behaviors that you have for Johnny. You can build an internalizing problems form. Instead of using our general internalizing problems, you can build one for Louisa that focuses only on her major issues with depression and anxiety and concentrates the progress monitoring on those issues that she displays that you are targeting for change. So you can get as specific as you want to be with each individual child. So how does this work? How do you build your own customized form? So when you access the Flex Monitor, you'll see a screen that looks like the one on the right half of my screen. For custom forms, you choose from our item pool and you start building your own form. And you'll see up here at the top, you can choose the age group that you want the form to tap. And it could be just two to five, just six to 11, just 12 to 18. Or if you're doing a group of kids that you want to monitor that cut across these age ranges, you can only view, then you can set it to only review items that cut across all three age levels or any two age levels. Then you select the items that correspond to the rater that you want, teacher, parent, or student. And again, it could be, okay, I want teacher and parent items. So you could then only select from items that correspond to both or each individually. So you have all of that flexibility to design the form around the age and the rater or raters that you want. Next, 
you see this box, which says search by category. This is where you can filter items. So you don't have to scroll through all 700 items, uh, 700 plus items, by the way. You could go into this box, say, well, you know, um, I really want to have items for Johnny that look at attention, hyperactivity, and executive function, other areas of executive function. So you can put in attention, hyperactivity, and executive function into this search bar. When you click search, it will then pull up in the main body on the left side, all items that are designed to measure attention, hyperactivity, and executive function. Then you build your form by simply going through those items and all you have to do is click on the item. When you click the item, it drags it over to the right-hand column of the form. And the items will populate over here as you click on each of the items. As you're doing this, in the background, we are continuously computing the reliability data. Then if at some point you say, hey, you know, um, I've got 10 attention items, five hyperactivity items, and five other area of executive function items, I wonder how reliable this scale is. All you have to do is click this button down near the bottom right that says compute reliability. And within typically one to three seconds, we will give you the internal consistency reliability coefficient. And you can decide whether or not the form that you've created that now that you're happy with the actual content, are you happy with the psychometric reliability? And in general, you're going to want a reliability coefficient above 0.8 to monitor individual change. So you can then adjust that, or you might decide, hey, you know, wow, I built a scale that has a, an internal consistency reliability coefficient of 0.95. That's more than I need. And this one's 25 items. Um, I, I want the teacher to be able to do it more quickly than that you can start scaling it back and let's say you take it down to 18 items and you can do a reliability check and now say it's 0.9 and you're happy with that. So then you simply save the form and there's, you'll notice another box here that says share this form with other users on your account. If you are, for example, in a school district or a clinic, where there's a master account and you have a sub account, if you check share this form, what that means is that everyone else on this master account would have the ability to use the form that you created. They will not be able to see Johnny's completed protocols or Johnny's file. That still is specific to your password. But what they could do, if you allow it, is access um, Maryland's ADHD rating form, if you want to name it that, because you get to give it a name. And they could then use that with other kids, but you can also keep it specific to you and not allow them to use it. All you have to do is uncheck that box and then you're the only one who will have the ability to use this particular form. One of the things that you can also do is sit down with a group. You can project this up on a screen. You can sit down with a group of your colleagues and you could all build a form together and agree on the item content of the form and then save it into the master account so you would all have access to a common progress monitoring form. 
that you had all agreed upon for applications in a specific purpose. You can also create a general form that you all like, and then you can adjust that form at any time, resave it under a different name so that you don't lose your master form. So you can adjust and tweak forms at any time to create forms that are unique to a specific child or to a specific rater. Maybe you have a teacher who has specific complaints about a child's behavior in their classroom that don't seem to be apparent in some other classes. Well, one of the things you can do is create a flex monitor behavior monitoring form just for use with that student in that teacher's class and label it. Say Louisa's behavior monitoring form for Mrs. Jackson. And then just have that teacher complete that form if you choose to. You could also have as, you know, as many other teachers as you want to. But you can be that creative and that specific if you want to. And again, you can share your form at any point with others or keep it private. You can modify the form at any time that you want. Uh, we give you permission to print the form uh, and use it. And everything I've described so far about this is free. There's no charge for anything that you've done to build your forms, to modify your forms, to print your forms. But hey, eventually you got to pay. So uh, you're only charged for use of the flex monitor when you score it. So um, that's when Pearson steps up and, uh, and gets their little bit. So uh, you do, when you score it, is when you're charged. Uh, if you do have, by the way, the, uh, a subscription to the Pearson Digital Assessment Library, then the flex monitor is included within that and there's no added cost for the flex monitor so i hope you can see how easy it is to build this and how creative you can be as your own personal test developer and test author and let's see uh, for some reason my screen has frozen folks so when this has happened on Zoom in the past, what I have had to do, uh, there we go. Okay, that worked. All right. Um, so the forms can be shared with other users in a school clinic or other hierarchy that where there's a master account. The reliability data are provided to the creator of the form based on the BAS three standardization samples. Then we generate T-scores uh, based on all the different standardization samples. And remember that we give you choices of norms. So you get combined gender norms, same gender norms, and clinical samples that you can look at with all of this. We give you all of those normative options. Then we're going to, as you use it over time, give you intra-individual comparisons. We'll compare time one with two, one with three, one with four, two with three, two with four, all of that. And we're gonna do all the math for you and give you the comparisons based on reliable change metrics. And that's gonna look like this. Here, for example, is uh, a child who was assessed twice with a flex monitor prior to an intervention being put into place. And then after the intervention, we've graphed three more assessments here. And you'll see you get a nice pictorial and you can also cut and drop this into a report if you need to, or print it, put, put it in a child's file or maintain it digitally. You'll see that we give you the T-scores at the bottom of the graph, the raw scores. Then we give you the actual change from the initial score. Then we give you 
the statistical significance of the difference. And that's calculated using a reliable change index. And that's from the initial score. And then you'll see a delta or change from the previous score. So this compares the adjacent pairs. And then we tell you whether or not that comparison is statistically significant. So you can monitor change using appropriately calculated reliable change statistics where all of that's done for you. And you can monitor it visually by viewing this graph. And graphs are a very powerful way to show this to other people who don't want to get bogged down in the statistics. So you have all of that available to you for the preordained forms and for every form that you create. You can generate exactly this kind of graph. So why choose the flex monitor? I hope you figured that out. But it's really a desire on Randy and I's part to move the field for better practice and make you better at your job and make you more efficacious. So we feel like giving you the power to create your own individualized tests for the personalized scenarios that you face with programs or individual children really gives you the power to do your job much more efficaciously. We have more than 700 items that you can choose from to tailor to specific monitoring situations. You can filter these by form type, by child's age, by behavior type, uh, by conceptual dimension, however you want to do this. These are created using heavily vetted validated items with known characteristics and content relevance. So for example, uh, these items have all been subjected to review and editing by professional editors. They've been vetted by clinicians for content and construct consistency. So all of these items have been subjected to all the item analytics that are described in the BASC-3 manual for the items that ended up on the other BASC-3 forms. Extensive item analyses, including statistical evaluations for gender bias and ethnic bias. As I discussed earlier, they've been equated at the item level for equivalent applications in English and in Spanish. So you have uh, an enormous item pool that's been subjected to all of the professional development expertise that went in to BAS 3. You don't need to use informal assessments. You don't need to make up your own informal scale about which you have no data. You don't have to guesstimate the accuracy of change. Uh, you don't have to wonder if your items are culturally biased or gender biased. The flex monitor solves those problems for you. In every other area of assessment, you scrutinize the psychometric properties of the instruments that you use. But for some reason, we have tended to ignore psychometrics when doing progress monitoring, and we've just made up informal solutions. You don't need to do that anymore. You get comprehensive reporting with comparisons of current scores to a baseline. And we think this is a unique offer that is just unmatched anywhere that allows you to move forward. As I said, if your district subscribes to the digital assessment library, the flex monitor, including all on screen administration scoring and reporting is part of your existing product. If not, the pricing uh, at this stage, um, the manual is $60 uh, for the digital manual, and then it's $1.35 for each scored report. So each time you do the reporting, uh, you'll be charged. Uh, we are looking at other pricing options now. 
and there will be additional pricing options for you in the future. So with that, we're going to delay questions until the end. So I'm going to skip past that part. But thank you for listening to me. We're going to take about a three to five minute break. I'm going to tell you three. We're going to start back in five with or without you. And during that time, I'm going to pass this over to Drs. Hughes and Quinn. And they're going to demonstrate to you exactly how they've been able to use this effectively in their practice with real children in real schools. So we'll see you back in five. Thank you. Are we muted? Probably not. Okay. That's no, a we, Sherry question. We are live. <laughs> Excellent. If you want, you can go ahead and share mm -hmm. your PowerPoint. Perfect. Then we're all set. We'll just wait a few minutes. And guys, I'm going to mute my mic for their presentation and I'll come back at the end when we do the Q&A. Just so everybody knows. Okay. Bye bye. Hello, everyone. Um, we're just taking a little break. If you want to get a cup of coffee or stretch, we will be starting in a couple of minutes.
Dr. Hughes and Dr. Quinn, if you're ready to get started. All right, great. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, so we have a case here for you that really goes through um, how we used a flex monitor. So you can kind of see, you know, what decisions do you make? How do you decide what kind of questions to ask? And how is this going to be the most beneficial for your practice? So um, to get started, we'll just kind of give you a background here on our case. Um, so our case here is about Sam. Sam is a 13 year old. Sam had concerns related to uh, their interpersonal relationships. They were experiencing a lot of anxiety and depression symptoms, and they were beginning to question some of their gender identity. Sam prefers to use they, them, their pronouns um, within the past year, but was experiencing a lot of pushback from family and teachers. Um, they were experiencing no one was using the pronouns that they would like within different environments, and it was experiencing significant stress for this. So for Sam, the goal for treatment in general was they stated they wanted to make themselves feel better with their sadness and anxiety. Um, on top of this, when speaking to parents, the parents noted that they were questioning if autism spectrum disorder was also an appropriate diagnosis at this time. So you can see there was a lot of different things going on for Sam. So developmentally, we wanted to take, you know, just a good look overall holistically. Developmentally, Sam um, met all milestones within normal limits, no major concerns during early childhood. Um, there was no major eating or weight difficulties. However, over the past few years, Sam began to experience unwanted weight gain, which was a concern for mom. Um, Sam also has pretty significant trouble falling asleep, a lot of racing thoughts at night. Um, however, once Sam could fall asleep, they would stay asleep through the night. And then something new over the past few years was Sam began experiencing um, some bedwetting about once a week. And mom questioned a lot of, you know, what was going on? What did that really relate to? Was there a medical issue? Is there something going on with the mental health aspect? And then um, they didn't note any major motor tics during early childhood. Mom couldn't recall seeing any, but in the past few months, they started to notice that Sam had some motor tics such as head movements, um, a lot of twitching in the neck, and that was present during the evaluation process as well. Medically, Sam has been a healthy child, um, no major, you know, vision, hearing, medical, physical limitations, a few illnesses growing up, but nothing that required any long-term um, care or any major complications. Um, at the time when Sam came to see us, Sam was prescribed multiple medications um, for mental health, primarily the Lexapro and Trazodone, um, and then also some medication as well for some medical concerns with stomach. And then a family history of depression and anxiety was endorsed. Um, within the medication, and we'll go into it in a few minutes, um, Sam wasn't experiencing any symptom relief with the Lexapro or the Trazodone either. Educationally, um, Sam has always done very well in school. Sam currently is a seventh grade student. Um, during the past two years, they attended school in the hybrid format or virtually, as many of our students had to do over the past few years. Um, as Sam began to go back to the school setting, Sam began to experience a lot of anxiety regarding academics, um, anxiety regarding their performance in band, and a lot of anxiety with interactions with teachers. Um, and as I noted before, the, the teachers were continuing to use pronouns that Sam didn't identify with any longer. So um, everyone in school was continuing to say she, her, even after Sam had written multiple emails, um, had multiple meetings with the school, there was just no changes. Um, additionally, Sam tends to withdraw and have limited social interactions with peers. So overall, Sam just doesn't feel that school is a happy place for them. Um, and then Sam's mother was also concerned that there was going to be um, difficulties with Sam's bathroom choice and the pronouns. Um, so the concern was, you know, whether switching over to pronouns was appropriate at this time for Sam or continuing to use the she, her, so that um, there was no complications within the bathroom selections. 
Um, regarding the family history, Sam's parents divorced in 2015, and they both have joint custody of Sam. Um, Sam resides primarily with their mother during the week, and then on the weekends um, goes to their father's house. Sam has a positive relationship with their mother, um, and the relationship with the father can be described as strained. They had a falling out back in 2017. It's improved slightly over time, but Sam still discussed the comfort level wasn't fully there yet with their father. Um, and as noted, you know, multiple times now, the significant stressor here for Sam was no one was really beginning to accept the transition. Socially, Sam reports having a few close friends. They like to play video games. They play Mario Kart, Minecraft. Um, they met this fr these friends at school and sometimes they go to each other's homes. Sam described her, their friends as honest and supportive. They try to make their friendship work the best they can. And then Sam reported that they have a girlfriend. Um, they've been dating for approximately a year. And when asked um, how the relationship started, Sam said, we talk a couple times throughout the year. Um, and mom reported they weren't sure how close the relationship was, but um, Sam tries to communicate a few times through text messages or online outlets. And then in terms of interests and hobbies, Sam enjoys music, band, reading, painting, and playing video games. Um, mental health wise, Sam's parents have reported that Sam has always been shy, always really afraid to try anything new, um, significant difficulties adjusting to any change. And this has been since early childhood. And then Sam gets frustrated very easily when something doesn't go right especially situations in school. If Sam's not doing well or um, is afraid of failing at a task, Sam gets easily frustrated. Um, when feeling nervous, Sam bites their nails. And as I noted before, is recently starting to show a motor tick, so head movements. And then within the past year, Sam has really experienced an increase in the anxiety and depression symptoms. Um, in January of 2020, Sam identified as non-binary and gay, and at the same time, this is really when the family started to see the anxiety and depression increase. So when Sam came to us for the evaluation process um, to get treatment, Sam immediately began started counseling after the evaluation, and sessions were on a weekly basis. And you'll see as we go through the flex monitor, eventually we were able to move out into every three weeks um, because of, there was a decrease in symptoms. As noted, initially, Sam was prescribed um, 30 milligrams of Prozac and Sam reported it helped some of the anxiety symptoms. However, they were experiencing a significant increase in their suicidal thoughts. So it shifted up to about three to four times a week. So then due to that, the Prozac was switched to Lexapro, um, but Sam still began to report high suicide ideation and anxiety was starting to increase again. So, you know, there wasn't really a great medication option for Sam at the time. Um, nothing was really working and helping all of the, the symptoms. So for the evaluation process to kind of just get a good baseline of where Sam was, determine appropriate diagnoses, um, there was a clinical interview with Sam and the mom participated in the clinical interview. Uh, the WISC was used, the WISC-5, the NEPSI, um, the DCAFs, the ADOS was used to determine if autism was still, was still an appropriate diagnosis here. Um, as well as the autism spectrum rating scale. And then the BASC-3 was also used. So we administered it to um, both mom and dad and Sam, but only the mom's BASC-3 got returned and Sam's. So we don't have the data from the dad. During the observation, it was uh, observed that Sam had very minimal eye contact, um, spoken a flat affect, had a monotone voice throughout. Sam responded to questions, but often needed some prompting to express more, share more information. Um, answers were pretty limited, and Sam did not engage in any spontaneous speech. Um, Sam needed questions asked to them to answer. And then also it was observed that interests were immature for age range. So Sam's interests were matching that of a developmental level of a seven to eight year old. Um, for example, Sam was very, very interested in Paw Patrol and spoke frequently about watching it and some of the different uh, memorabilia that they have at home.
And then when asked about her mood, Sam provided some examples of how her how the mood can change depending on the environment. So example, how they feel at school versus how they feel at home with mom or with dad. And then Sam described that having previous suicidal thoughts about five to six times a week, they were unclear on why their mother was so concerned about that. Um, multiple times they made statements saying, I thought everybody had that, or I thought this was normal. So there was just really a lack of understanding of why some of the symptoms were concerning to others. And then during testing, Sam often tried um, to avoid tasks that became more complex by speaking about uh, their pets, their love for dogs, often would try to pull out a picture on the phone and say, would you like to see my dog? Uh, but Sam was easily redirected and then would engage again back on the material. Um, overall, just to kind of get an understanding of where Sam was cognitively, their IQ fell in the average range. Most of their skills were typically developed, um, some strengths in verbal reasoning, cognitive flexibility, but then a significant weakness in cognitive inhibition. And then on the ADOS, Sam fell in the moderate range on module three. So the cutoff score um, within the spectrum is a seven and then cutoff for autism is a 10 based on the norms on the ADOS. Sam's score fell at an 11, so a little bit right above, you know, the cusp for autism. And then, you know, we, we coincided data from the ASRS, the parent report and other areas. In terms of the rating skills on the BASC, Sam reported very high levels of anxiety and depression, and I'll show you the BASC data in a second. Um, also reported symptom, symptoms of problematic school engagement, attention difficulties, very low self-esteem, um, difficulties with feeling reliant on themselves, and a lot of interpersonal difficulties, parents and peers combined. And then Sam's mother reported concerns related to anxiety, depression, um, and also noted withdrawal, somatic complaints, some attention problems, and some difficulties with adaptive skills. So let me show you their BASCs. So this here is the MOMS um, BASC 3 clinical and adaptive scores. So you can see anxiety is clinically significant, depression is clinically significant, somatization is clinically significant. Um, and then over here in the adaptive, we have activities of daily living, you know, falls right on that cusp between at risk into clinically significant. So the main areas that Sam is reporting saying, I have a lot of anxiety. I have, have a lot of depression. Mom is seeing these as well. And then on the content scales for mom, we can see um, emotional self-control, executive functioning, and negative emotionality all fall in that at-risk range. So all really correlating with the main concerns coming into the evaluation. And then when we look at Sam's self-report, um, and I should make a note too that the validity, um, everything was valid and reliable within the BASCs for both parent and Sam. Um, so when we look at Sam's, again, we see, you know, a lot of trouble with school, really not liking school, not feeling safe or supported by the teachers. Um, and then Sam's internalizing, we see a lot of social stress, anxiety, depression is very high for Sam as well as somatization, not feeling adequate, um, attention troubles. And then over here in the personal adjustment, self-esteem is all the way down at the, the bottom, which Sam is also reporting within the interviews, um, and then trouble with parents and, and peer relationships. Um, and then within the content scales, Sam, you know, her scores fell in the high clinically significant risk for mania, as well as for test anxiety. And then ego strength was very, very low, as well as functional impairment was clinically significant as well. So overall, Sam's reporting a lot of concerns across multiple um, composites. So diagnostically, you know, looking at everything in the history, looking at all of the data, the diagnoses were autism spectrum level one, major depressive disorder, severe, and then generalized anxiety disorder. And now, as I noted earlier, Sam's main concern for themselves was how do, 
how do I make myself feel better? How do I stop feeling so sad? So this is really where we moved into the Basque Flex on how do we progress monitor the things that are really important to Sam currently. So treatment was tailored. Um, uh, right away, Sam's medication was changed to better fit the needs of their symptoms. The results were shared with the psychiatrist who could then tailor the medication. And then Sam and their family engaged in two psychoeducational sessions regarding gender identity, sexual orientation. The primary goal for this was to really help Sam find a way to communicate with their parents and say, I would like to use different pronouns. I would like you to I, use the same pronouns as me and understand my gender identity. And so Sam's mom, dad, and Sam all engaged in these sessions right away. And then Sam also continued on to have their own individual sessions where they used components of DBT and CBT um, and really also worked on, you know, stress management, coping skills, things to support that anxiety and depression symptoms. And then on the side, Sam was also receiving social skills treatment um, within a group setting that really helped work on how do you talk to others your age? How do you build conversations? How do you make and keep friends? How do you read nonverbal cues? So they were both kind of split up, but the main component of the, the treatment, the individual therapy was the depression and anxiety symptoms. So when we get to how do we use BAS Flex then? So we know within the, the BAS, the depression and anxiety subscales were very elevated. They fell in the clinically significant range. So if you look on the left of my screen, you can see what are the questions that fall in that self-report on the BASC-3 for depression. And so these are all the questions that fall in the depression subscale. Now, when I was choosing the BASC Flex questions, as noted, you can change whatever questions you want or include whatever you'd like. But for me, I wanted to get mine as close as I possibly could to the depression subscale. So I used all the possible questions that fall under depression for Sam's age range and self-report. And um, within the Basque Flex, you use the ones that fall in never, sometimes, often, or always. So you can see in that red box, all of the questions there fell on the original BASC-3, and then I pulled those for the flex so that every single counseling appointment, Sam was filling out the same exact questions so we could progress monitor those symptoms over time. And here's the same ones for the anxiety. So you can see on the self-report, here are all the questions related to the anxiety on the original BASC-3. And the questions in the red box, again, are the ones that were able to be pulled over to the flex so that the subscales could stay pretty closely related here. Now, something that's um, important to know is parents were also offered if they wanted to complete the same BASC Flex weekly as well um, to really correlate with their original BASCs, and then we could progress monitor how parents are seeing symptoms. Um, parents did not want to engage in that, so for the purpose of this case study, we only ended up using the self-report um, questionnaire. So here is, you know, a graph. I know um, Dr. Reynolds earlier had showed us some of these. So th this one here correlates with Sam. So as you can see in that circle, um, that circle red down there below, that is the original Basque data. And when we pull those questions, we can see Sam is falling really, really low here. Um, a lot of depression symptoms. The intervention line is when the psychoeducation session started, as well as the change in medication. So you can see um, we're slowly coming up already. At the end of the evaluation process, going through the feedback with Sam, they were already starting to feel comfort, more comfortable with the fact that they were moving in the right direction with um, communicating and discussing some of the things they were talking about. But you can see right when that intervention starts, we're really seeing an, an increase. So as counseling went on, the data really shows a, a line of depression symptoms are significantly decreasing here. So over time, as we see that it's staying up, it's progressing, we know, all right, our intervention is working. What we're doing here is helpful. So we can eventually move into every few weeks doing therapy or really progress monitoring, seeing um, how of much of the symptoms are decreasing. So this is what you'll see when you pull the flex um, at the bottom underneath your graph. You get to look at every single question and you get to see how has their answer changed. So when I look at this one for the depression symptoms, 
I can see that very early on within a few months, Sam is reporting, I'm never feeling, I'm not feeling these at all. This is never happening for me again. So for example, Sam started in the, I feel like my worst get, my life is getting worse and worse. Sam started saying almost always I'm feeling this way. And by the time we hit March, Sam reported, I'm never feeling this way. Um, And that continued across. You can see that I feel depressed and I feel sad. Occasionally, Sam would switch back and forth between sometimes and never. But overall, we're seeing a, a decrease in the symptoms that started very high at almost always. And then we also tracked at the same time the anxiety symptoms because that was another main area of concern. So every session, Sam filled out the depression flex and the anxiety flex. And you can see the circle again. Um, Sam's symptoms were very high for, for them. And then as the intervention went across, the medication change, the psychoeducation, the individual therapy, the anxiety significantly decreased. You can see that line goes up for them. They, need, they fall back into their goal zone. And here's the questions for the anxiety as well. Um, so you can see on that first day in January, almost all of the ones that coincide with anxiety, they're saying, this is often happening for me or almost always it's happening. But then by the last session over in June, Sam's not experiencing any of these symptoms. So this is a really nice way to, as you're going through and looking at the graph, if you really want to pinpoint, well, is it all of the questions that Sam is feeling better on? Is there one that they're still kind of stuck on, right? Maybe um, if we look here, we see, I feel stressed. Sam is still sometimes feeling stressed. It's a really nice way to then go back into the questions and say, okay, you know what? Little things aren't bothering you anymore, but you're still feeling stressed. So how can we really pinpoint and tailor intervention to get at your stress levels, give you those coping skills? Um, you can go through and really uh, take a look at all of those um, nitty gritty pieces of, of treatment. And the other nice thing too is, you know, at the end of every few weeks, we would graph this and then I would um, provide it to the parents and say, hey, look, treatment is working. All of these changes that we've made are really working. And we're not just saying, well, Sam says they're feeling better. Instead, it's there is you know, data right here to really show you Sam is progressing, symptoms are decreasing and not just a self-report out loud saying, yeah, I'm feeling better or you know, doing a feelings thermometer. We have that data to show. So speaking of that, <laughs> I'm here to show you um, some cases um, that are not doing as well. So um, first thing I wanna point out to you all is you can see that um, the goal zone can either be on top or on bottom. And sometimes uh, that's more intuitive to people. So if you if things are increasing or decreasing, um, you can manage that um, in the, in the um, program itself. But what I want you to look at for this one is um, this is an intervention that you can see uh, we was delivered at school um, from October to March. And um, what I hope is obvious to you is the person was already in the goal zone. So uh, what happened in this case was that the teacher um, was collecting the information. Uh, baseline, yes, doing baseline, great, 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 started our intervention, and then collected information. And then in about March, decided to enter it. And so because the information was not entered in a timely fashion, they basically did an intervention for a kid that um, didn't show improvement because the kid was already hitting um, the goals. And so that really makes you wonder, uh, you know, uh, what the purpose was of intervention, time, resources, um, things like that. And I, I fear, <laughs> I fear this is happening in um, districts everywhere because I see it everywhere. Um, let me go to the next one, Sydney. So let's look at this one. This is a kid that was getting um, an executive functioning intervention. So same thing, we start progress monitoring, doing our baseline, things are fine. Then they start the um, executive functioning intervention and the kid actually gets worse. He's actually going in the wrong direction. And um, 
in this case, the child advocated for a decrease in intervention, which the school uh, responded to, and he went back down, but then, because it was part of his IEP, they re-implemented it. And so he started getting worse again. And um, so this brings me to two things. One is not only progress monitoring, but timely progress monitoring used, used for decision-making and really being able to show that things don't just always get better. We've shown you um, lots of two, a couple of cases where things do get better, but they don't always. The other thing that really matters for you as uh, clinicians is the movement from No Child Left Behind over to e ESSA and the change from scientifically-based interventions to evidence-based interventions. All of that is to say that there is a movement between not just do I have a uh, have I selected an intervention that has an evidence base, but is the intervention actually working for the child that I'm, that I'm working with? So just because it has an evidence base for some group of, of kids, does it work for the, the child that I'm working with now? And that has been a movement that has uh, not only been coming and that school psychologists already um, advocate for, but it really is required in, in the school setting. So, Again, these two cases are really just to show you, and I know y'all know this already, but sometimes we spend a lot of times doing things that really aren't being effective. And sometimes just because it's already written in an IEP and sometimes um, we can do things that where folks don't actually get better. And we really do need to make that adjustment in real time. I'm very aware that we are, um, closing in on time here. And um, I do want to give us time for questions um, if folks have any. I see that people think this is perfectly clear. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not sure. Sherry, are you curating the questions? Erin, can you take questions? You're on mute. No. I guess I'm also curious if folks have used it um, it's sort of in real time. Uh, for decision making, because that's really where I see the disconnect happening in, in our schools um, is people will do progress monitoring, but not really use it for real time decision making. They sort of do it at the quarterly reviews if there's an IEP or, um, you know, basically teacher complaints <laughs> if, uh, if there's, you know, if teachers are complaining about the child, but not really using it in real time. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, so if you can type your questions into the Q&A, um, I'd be happy to read the questions out loud so that our um, our panelists can, can answer those questions. So go ahead and type any questions that you have into the Q&A box, um, and then I'll read them out loud, and, and you guys can decide who wants to respond to each question. So um, one question that just came in is, um, someone that works with students that are deaf and hard of hearing exclusively. Are the items culturally relevant for this group avoids words like speak or other references to oral communication? Well, you know, one of the, the beauties of the Flex Monitor is that you can decide what items are or are not appropriate for the specific child that you're dealing with. So you absolutely can choose items that fit uh, the deaf and hard of hearing culture very easily. Um, you get to be the test author. So you bring all of your expertise with this sample to the test development process. So absolutely, uh, go through, pick the items. You'll find an abundance of items. There will be an occasional item that will not work as well with deaf and hard of hearing if you interpret the item literally. But the vast majority of the, item, uh, majority of the items will be appropriate. 
And again, the beauty of it is you get to decide because you build the test. Great, thank you. Um, this one I'll ask Dr. Quinn. When scoring, what gender area did you choose for a student that identifies as non-binary? So uh, sometimes I'll, what I'll do is I'll go in and score it twice um, on um, both genders and see what the significant changes are, if there's any majors, or I'll just use the clinical uh, population um, to determine you know, where they fall within the depression and anxiety in general across any gender there. Um, I'm not sure, you know, Dr. Reynolds or Dr. Hughes, if you have one that you choose to choose when you're working with a student who's non-binary. For, for initial diagnostic purposes, the combined gender norms are the most accurate for all students, um, whether they are non-binary or not. For progress monitoring, because we're primarily interested in change and tracking change over time, it is in one sense irrelevant which one you choose. Um, for purely the, the purpose of tracking change because the change is gonna show up no matter which group you use. But I think there's a case to be made for in progress monitoring, choosing uh, the group with which the student most closely identifies. And that is appropriate for a variety of reasons. One is it's just, it's going to be more pleasing to them uh, that you've done that and there's no reason not to. It's not going to affect your ability to monitor change. And it's going to assist you with developing and maintaining rapport uh, with the student. And so you can track that change really with any group because you're interested mostly in the change. But I think there are a lot of, uh, if you will, culturally appropriate and rapport reasons for tracking change in the context of the child's identification. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hughes, I'd like you to take this one. How many data points do you recommend obtaining before making a, de a decision about intervention and treatment changes? Yeah, so I usually like to see three data points, um, unless, as in that case, where the kid themselves is advocating um, so, uh, Dr. Reynolds was just talking about rapport and we all know kids will say, you know, you're treating me like a baby. I don't need to know this, blah, 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 blah. I already know this. And, um, if they're in the goal zone, then we probably need to be thinking about what we're doing. If they're not in the goal zone, sometimes kids don't have insight and they say they already know it and they really don't. Then you have the data to show, well, you're doing this part well, but not that part well. And that's where splitting out the symptoms or the questions is really very helpful. Um, but when the child's report matches uh, what's happening, um, and basically what that child was saying is you're being insensitive to what my needs actually are. I think we have a real responsibility to, you know, to make sure that we're, that we're actually showing a need that we're making and not just delivering a program um, sort of, you know, a brand name program without, you know, meeting the kid's need. Yeah. And if I could weigh in purely as a statistician uh, on that question, um, you have to have three data points. Uh, Dr. Hughes is exactly right. Um, you cannot establish a trend in any kind of statistical trend analysis with fewer than three data points. Great. Thank you. Uh, another related question was about the frequency um, of administering progress monitoring. So I think that would be another one, a good one to address right after talking about um, how many points, how frequent do you monitor them? Every two weeks? Is that too often? Not often enough? You know, I'd, I'd be interested in in, uh, in hearing from uh, Dr. Hughes and Quinn on that, uh, but I, I clearly have an opinion on that. And it's not one that, that everybody likes because it's it sounds non-definitive, but it is, I think, definitive. It depends upon the individual and it depends upon the intervention. 
how soon do you expect to see change? That's how often you should use it. And that will differ by disorder. It'll differ by specific behaviors. It will differ by setting. It will differ by individual. And that's why people that generally don't like that answer. They want me to give them a number, uh, two weeks, three weeks, six weeks. And I think that uh, if we engage in individualized practice, the right answer is it's individualized. When you expect to see change is when you should be measuring. I, I agree with that. And the only addition I would say is, has to do with the fidelity of the treatment, right? And so particularly when we, I, I use this a lot for program level um, evaluations. And so if you have you know, a series of teacher changes in your uh, emotional support classroom or your autism support classroom, or you have, you know, a maternity leave and then somebody isn't doing things, you know, to fidelity. So yeah, they've been doing it for, you know, five weeks, but those five weeks aren't really very good data at all. Now, you can get data that says, particularly when we're, you're looking at a program level, look, we, are, we, aren't, we aren't nailing it here. We aren't um, doing this with fidelity, even though you think you uh, you think you are, um, but that's uh, when you when we turn this conversation just a little bit over to pro to um, progress monitoring for programs. This also gives us information about the adults. So, for example, if we I'll just take autism because that's a, a relatively easy or more defined intervention. Um, if kids are not improving whatsoever when we really think they should be, we might be looking at, is it being delivered uh, in the right place? So you can look at it both for match for the kid, but also um, you know, the treatment integrity and the fidelity. And, yeah. and, a, and a quick plug, if you look um, at, at the BAS-3 family of, of materials, you will find um, forms for evaluating treatment fidelity. Uh, we developed those many years ago. They've been tried out and uh, modified through iteration uh, from folks in the field over the years. So we do have treatment fidelity monitoring forms available to you because we recognize that that is a critical piece of this. Um, Dr. Hughes is exactly right. Uh, if, if the intervention is not being faithfully delivered, you need to know that too. Yeah, the other thing I'd really quick like to add about this question too is the BAS Flex is so different from the BAS 3 in the sense that when you're filling these questions out, it takes maybe two to three, maybe tops five minutes to answer a few questions. So I'm more willing to do it every week right away because it's such a quick process. And then once I kind of see that everything's really starting to stay about the same within my goal line, that's when I'll start to move to every, every other week to every three weeks, because it's such a quick process. I'd rather just have as many data points as I can right from the beginning. Great. Thank you. Uh, another question about does there need to be, or is it preferred to have a baseline with the full BASC three rating skills form before using the flex monitor? or could it be just as useful independently? So my answer to that is if you already feel comfortable that you understand the totality of the problem, then you may not need an intervention, a, a, you know, a whole evaluation. So if you're not starting from scratch, but if you're really trying to figure out what's going on, you probably need, um, you know, an understanding, a comprehensive understanding um, of the child's needs. Um, certainly for kids that are already involved in special education, which I see very often, um, well, they already have their diagnosis, the things are understood, and now we are, let's say, changing grades or moving from elementary to middle or middle to high school, and we kind of have these life-changing events, and um, or medication has been changed or what have you, and so we're pretty certain this is ADHD, we know it's ADHD, we're you know, moving settings and changing, you know, task demand. And so we, we can start there. But, um, but if you, if you're not sure, um, then, uh, then, uh, you know, you, you have to start sort of at understanding. Now, that's for my special ed kids, for gen ed kids, sometimes 
you know, if they come in for a very specific issue, anxiety is very common, depression is very common. Um, you might not need a whole evaluation at all. Yeah, for, for kids in special ed, as you know, there should have been a comprehensive evaluation uh, that is uh, reasonably current for you to base this on. And, and one of the things I love about, uh, uh, about what uh, Dr. Hughes and Quinn are doing is taking the comprehensive BAS-3 results and using that to tailor their flex monitor form. So that's a wonderful application. Uh, it is really a, a very effective and efficacious way to use this. So if a child has had a comprehensive evaluation, which for special ed kids they should have, and uh, hopefully they included BAS-3 as, as a component of that, if they had behavioral or emotional issues, you can go back to that fast three and engage in the process that they described for you just a little while ago and look and see what are the items that are being endorsed about this kid on the comprehensive fast three and then pull those from the flex monitor item tool into your flex monitor. Great, thank you. Uh, another question came in about using the flex monitor in an alternative school setting to see a student's progress and determining when they can return to regular school. Would it be a good assessment to use in that purpose? Uh, so uh, I live in alt ed, juvenile justice, criminal justice land. <laughs> so, um, so it depends on why they are placed out into alt ed. That's the, the short story. Some people are in alt ed for drug bringing drugs to school or weapons uh, uh, violations. And those are, you know, predetermined um, timeframes. And sometimes um, people are in alt ed or in other kinds of placements um, because they need to be able to, um, you know, be able to be in a, a, a less restrictive environment than the one that they're in. So the answer is, is if you, what you're trying to determine is, are they able to function in a less restrictive environment um, you can absolutely use BAST Flex data. I use it all of the time, um, usually around behavioral symptoms. Um, also, sometimes I'll make my own um, BAST Flex for things like um, self-advocacy, uh, relationships with teachers. So it's not that so much that they need to not have anxiety and depression anymore, but rather are they able to appropriately access the services that are in back in their regular education uh, gen ed environment um, in a way that it, you know makes sense there. And so um, I very much tailor it to whatever the problem is that sent them uh, out. And in my state, um, there's five criteria for alt ed and two of them are very, very generic. They're like, didn't follow the school handbook and difficulty following instructions from authority figures. And so um, when they're really generic like that, it's important to understand from the sending school, you know, what, what's really happening here because people will fill things out in a very uh, non-specific way. And so it's hard to give them information if they're prepared. And sometimes, I, I'm sure you've seen it as well, people get sick of kids and they send them out just to give everybody a break in the building, which has nothing to do with the kids functioning whatsoever. Yeah. So um, there's political reasons uh, that things happen, uh, unfortunately, but that's the reality. And that doesn't have anything to do with kids. Or We've also used the Basque Flex in Alt Ed in a way of determining how kids felt about the Alt Ed program. So we looked at like how emotionally safe do you feel and pulled specific questions that said, are my teachers caring? I feel um, how they feel about school and peers and things like that. So it didn't really get, like we said, at depression or anxiety, but overall, as teachers were changing their program, did kids feel more safe within? And so we've done that in Alt Ed as well, which has been really helpful to see. We did, um, Sydney and I did a project where we looked at a, an alt ed setting that was for kids who were, uh, had contact, who were adjudicated, uh, contact with the system, but it also had dependent kids, so kids in foster care and contact with the system that was in delinquency. And we looked at their scores from how they felt on the unit, 
around building safety and relationships because trauma um, was part of their background. So how did you feel about working with the staff on the unit versus the teachers? And a lot of the acting out behavior was coming from the staff on the unit and not the teachers. We were able to pinpoint that, do trainings with the staff on the unit, and then help the teachers transition the kids to the school environment. So the, the unit might have been chaotic, but now we're here in school now, and now you here are the people you can trust and how you access safety and et cetera, et cetera. So it made the transition easier for the teachers, but it also improved sort of the overall functioning um, of the agency related to trauma and safety. There, I could go on and on and on and on about trauma-informed care and trauma safety and how to think about using the flex in those ways. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, there, I'll do maybe one other question, um, and if we didn't get to your question today, um, we'll definitely uh, try to follow up with you via email. Um, there is a question about if you have tried including questions where you know they have met the goal to help with asset-based engagement, not focusing on the problems alone or a validity check, and was that worth your time or a waste of time? So that depends on the kid, right? So some kids um, don't respond very well to that, particularly if it's not on grade level or on age level. So showing that they're meeting a goal that's um, underwhelming is not useful to them. Um, some kids really, really like that. It's very good to be able to, so, you know, I always say to, 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 to teachers and people in schools, you don't want to set goals that kids can't meet. Nobody wants to play a game they can't win. So if you set up an activity or you set up expectations and they're going to fail and fail and fail, um, you know, who wants, to, who wants to play that game? So, um, but I always like to be growth oriented. Um, kids that are you know, getting intervention, they usually are having some sort of challenge they're trying to get over. And um, I don't always, I don't try to think of it or characterize it in a deficit model because growth can be social, emotional, academic development growth, right? So you, my growth could be as a, you know, a gifted and talented kid. And I set my own goals to be um, around my creativity or managing my feelings to free up time for my creativity or something like that. So it doesn't have to be um, deficit oriented, but it should be growth oriented. Uh, and, and, and I would add that from the original conceptualization of BAS back uh, in, in, uh, in medieval times in the 1980s, uh, Randy and I adopted a philosophy that we always wanted, uh, and always is not a word I like to use very much, but we always wanted to include positive behaviors as a component of the BAS. And you see that in BAS, BAS 2, and BAS 3. And that continues as a matter of philosophy into the FLEX monitor. You will find a lot of items related to positive behaviors. Process. A lot of items yeah, re related to resiliency, for example. We have a wonderfully effective resiliency scale. Uh, we have a leadership scale. We have items that reflect accomplishment yeah. in the social and emotional domain. So uh, just as a matter of philosophy, uh, I like to include those anytime it's possible uh, to do so. Uh, and that uh, really reflects my belief in what I've characterized over my career from the 1970s as strength models of remediation and strength models of intervention. I like to find out what kids are good at and build on it. Great. I'm pretty sure there's a pro-social construct uh, in there. Yep. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Reynolds, Dr. Hughes, Dr. Quinn. Um, we really appreciated having you join us today to talk about this. We know how important it is to do progress monitoring 
and I think this was really helpful in sharing how the tool can work and, and how you know if, it, if things are not working, if your interventions are not working or if they are working. Um, and I think it was really great to have you share all that information with us today. So thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Um, and thanks everybody for joining us today to listen in. Um, we're yes. excited to learn more with you. Yes, thank you again for being here, everybody. And thank you, Dr. Hughes and Dr. Quinn for joining me. I appreciate you. Good to see you guys. Yeah, okay. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, look for your certificate and your email later this week. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And this does conclude our webinar. Thank you.